Soros, which we know the name Soros. Here's what Soros said recently, and I'm curious to get your take on uh, this. Soros is a guy that's worth, I don't know, $20 billion guy. He's a guy that is hated by the right, and a lot of people on the right think he is manipulative, deceptive, and he wants to inject his philosophies politically to this country. But here's what he said. He says, this is a Bloomberg article. Soros says, China's real estate crisis, Omicron, threatened Xi rule. Billionaire philanthropist George Soros and China's Xi Jinping may fail to extend his rule of the country later this year. In contrast to what most observers expect, Soros cited Xi enemies within the party, real estate crisis, ineffective vaccines, and a failing birth rate as factors working against him. Internal divisions in China are so sharp that it has found expression in various party publications, Soros said. Xi is under attack from those who are inspired by Deng Xiaoping's ideas and want to see a greater role for private enterprise. Mm. What do you think is going to happen with Xi and China? Well, my sense of it, and I'm definitely no expert, is that it's not easy for the Chinese to maintain internal unity. And so they tend to focus on that, and perhaps that's partly why China hasn't been as expansionist a power as it might have been. Maybe that's changed to some degree in recent years. But it's, it's a very large country. It has an incredibly diverse population. And so they have their own problems, their own internal problems, which are significant and, and preoccupying. And so I hope that they stay focused on their internal problems and that they stay focused on solving them. I mean, China has been forward-looking enough, thank God, to allow the free market enterprise to flourish despite the proclivity for implementing top-down, radical left state solutions. And the consequence of that has been, first of all, now China is a player in the international scene, for better or worse, I think mostly for better. I know that a lot of that was accomplished on the backs of the American working class, and that's catastrophic in many ways. But the fact that there aren't tens of millions of Chinese people starving that's a really good thing for international security and stability, and that's of no trivial benefit to the American working class as well. And the fact is that China makes a lot of cheap stuff that works, mostly, and that people who are more stressed economically have also benefited to that to a tremendous degree. So it seems that all of that has been good. The twist towards a more totalitarian mode of governance in the last 10 years. That's obviously extremely worrisome. The fact that China is a totalitarian state has had a very negative consequence on us in the West, especially in the immediate, uh, what would you call it, in the immediate emergence of the, of the pandemic, because what we did was we rushed to imitate a totalitarian state. We thought, Chinese lockdown, we better do it. It's like, really? Really? We better do what the CCP did. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what we did. And we'll see. We don't know what the consequence of that is yet. We'll see. Not good. Not good, in my estimation. And certainly the Johns Hopkins studies study seems to... It's only a partial study, in some sense. They've done the cost-benefit analysis. Costs so far... We have no idea what the costs are of having kids in masks for two years. We have no idea what the consequences are, what that's done, especially to introverted kids who are high in negative emotion because they're going to be looking for a reason to hide anyways. And who knows what that's done to their psychological development, both as children and as adolescents. We'll find out over time, but we haven't paid the price for the pandemic lockdowns even a little bit yet. And did we destroy our economy? Like these things take a long time. You know, they say if you're piling an oil tanker and you detect an iceberg in your path, you can see it. You've already hit it because it takes so long for you to turn that it's too late. Well, in some sense, these huge systems that we're a part of are like that, is that you can't tell when they're broken because they take a long time to fall over. And I don't know if our system is broken, but we're going to find out. And I don't know if the pandemic lockdowns broke it. And maybe they didn't. And hopefully they didn't. I mean, I was in New York City, in Manhattan, a month ago. And it was the first time I'd really gone out anywhere other than Toronto. And I'd been to New York a few years before. And it's a 
bounce in place. Manhattan, I love New York. It's such an amazing city. You know, the fact that Manhattan can even exist is just an ongoing absolute miracle. Seven million people compressed onto that island, and it's, it's pretty damn clean, and it's pretty safe, and it's really cool, and there's something to do all the time, and you can walk around free, and like, that bloody place is a miracle, that's for sure. And it looked pretty good. I thought, isn't this something? These people have been locked down for like 18 months and this place isn't on fire. It actually is pretty clean and most of the businesses are still open and isn't that a bloody miracle? And Which it most definitely is. And so let's pray and not be too resentful about all the foolishness. Let's pray that we wake up and we treat the pandemic like the flu and we get back to something resembling the normality of Florida and we put this behind us and we don't get too upset about January 6th and we don't get too vengeful about the Democrats and the radical left and we elect someone half sensible to run the Republicans and we carefully weave our way through to a peaceful future. We, let's pray for that because the alternative is pretty damn dismal and I don't think we have to have the alternative. You know, one of the, we talked about Trump earlier. Here's my dilemma with Trump, one of many. Um, he's beating the election was stolen drum pretty damn hard. And I look at that as an outsider again, because I'm Canadian, and I think, well, you Americans, you've been split 50-50 for like five decades, like right down the middle. Eh? And there's always election trouble. Because no system is 100% perfect. Maybe there's like a 1%, 2% margin of crookedness, something like that. And you're probably really not going to get rid of that. Maybe you can maneuver carefully to keep it so that it's never any more than 1% or 2%. But to get rid of that last bit of malfeasance and deception and corruption would take such a heavy hand that that would become worse than the problem. And... That's a real problem when you're split 50-50 because small e election irregularities can throw the whole election. Okay, so it isn't obvious precisely what can be done about that, but the election was stolen narrative, I think it's weak for a variety of reasons. The first is, it's pretty whiny. Like, why didn't you win with 5% margin then? So how do you know this isn't your fault? And you think the Republicans aren't gerrymandering congressional districts? Because they are. And so it's not obvious that even if it is the case that there is substantive election fraud, that it's all from one side. And so there's that. And then, you're sure that's the message you want to be sending people? That they shouldn't have faith in their most fundamental institution? You might be right, but... But it's in your interest for that to be true. And so that's a moral hazard. And then, well, what happens when you retake the House? Because that's what's going to happen. I think the Democrats are going to get stomped in the, in the upcoming election. Are those elections somehow valid, but yours wasn't? And so why magically, when the Republicans get elected, that's honest. But when they don't, it's not. And so doesn't that take the wind out of your story? It's like, well, it was stolen. Well, you have the House and the Senate. How do you account for that? So that, to me, that, that's going to weaken that narrative. Trump is capitalizing on anger. He's using the election issue as a means to an end. And he may believe it, but it doesn't matter because it's a weak story, especially when the Democrats lose the House. It's a weak story. So it's not going to, it doesn't have any momentum. But then it, it's worse than that because I also think, and I've talked to lots of Republicans about this, is that the best story you've got? You got tradition on your side. You got the truth as an adventure on your side. You got belief in truth on your side. That's been abandoned by the radical left. You've got belief in science on your side. You've got responsibility on your side. You've got the fundamental purpose of higher education on your side. You can't conjure up a better story for Americans than the election was stolen when, with all that on your side. That's just not very impressive. And I have sympathy for politicians in general in the United States. Congress people have very hard jobs. It's not a job I would like. I don't think it's a pleasant job. They spend a lot of their time fundraising, 25 hours a week, 
on the phone out of their congressional offices because otherwise they're not supported by their party leadership. 40% of them sleep in their offices when they go to Washington. They don't even have apartments. Those that do usually have little bitty apartments. Their families aren't there because it's hard to get families to move to Washington now with dual career families. They don't have much of a social group. They have to run for their job every two years. This is not a... Plus, they're under attack all the time and they're micromanaged and micro-scheduled. So... But I'm curious, what point are you trying to make? Are you trying to make a point with Trump saying the fact that you know, election was stolen because that's exactly what Hillary Clinton's position was for four years. That elections yeah, well, were stolen no, from no, her. No right? better no better when she does it. Oh no, I'm not even what I'm trying to say is I looked at it as a weak position. That, it is hey, a weak position. It is a weak position she was taking. I think okay. But that's the worst of it. It's but, like really where are you going with this? Are you going with the tell fact that Tell a better story. Tell a better story if you want yeah. to get reelected. Is that no, no 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 the way to re-election is through a better story, but that's not the reason to tell it. The reason to tell it is because you believe it. And the, for the first time in my life, really, I believe this to be the case, conservatives really have something to sell to young people. And they, have the, they can sell the meaning of responsibility because young people are bereft of meaning. And most people find meaning in responsibility. And, and when the right talks about responsibility, they kind of do it in that finger-wagging way that makes conservatives unpopular among young people. You should be responsible. It's like, yeah, you should. Why? Well, because your life is chaotic and meaningless and you're stuck in this juvenile surreality and it's really painful for you and you're anxious and aimless and goalless. And then you look at people who have a life because maybe you could have a life and you think, well, what does that life consist of? It's like, well, you have a committed, intimate relationship. There's one. You have friends that you're honest with and, and playful with. Mm -hmm. So you have a group of friends. You have a job or a career. You, know, you, you, you learn how to use your life, your time outside of work in a productive, engaging way. You regulate your susceptibility to the multitude of hedonistic temptations that are in front of you. Um, you pay some attention to your mental and physical health. You make a goal, some goals for the future that are concrete. Well, there's seven things you can do. They're all responsible things. Why? Because then your life will have some meaning. Now, you might say, well, what's the ultimate meaning? It's like, get those things straight first. They're not nothing. And maybe you won't be so damn miserable and bitter and resentful and angry and aimless and anxious and frustrated and disappointed and then ashamed if you had five of those seven things going well. And the conservatives can make that case. No bloody left isn't making that case. It's like for them, responsibility is pretty much equivalent to totalitarian patriarchal oppression. The conservatives could just take that and say, no, no, our institutions, they're pretty solid. Maybe if you don't like what's happening on the political front, you join a, a group, a church, uh, the Elks, the Rotary, some civic organization. Get in there and do your part. Why? Not because you should, even though you should, but because... Well, why not meet some people who are like-minded and have a social group? And you, you think Biden can, can have the kind of impact to push people away from the political party to the opposing side, similar to how Goldwater and what they did back in the days on how civil rights was handled when Barry Goldwater did what he did. And next thing, you know, African-Americans went from uh, only 60 percent uh, of them voting uh, Democrat to 92% four years later. They went from 60% to 92% four years later in the next election. And Republicans haven't had a chance on the African-American vote since 1964. Do you think the current climate is that big of a climate where the conversion from one side to the other side to say, listen, I don't agree with you guys on censoring. If the guys want to talk, leave them alone. The way you handle COVID by shutting everybody down, I don't agree with that. Constantly printing money, I don't agree with that. Do you think it could be something where it could flip that, that big? I don't know, because 20, the next presidential election in this climate is a long way away. Because, you know, who can predict the future even a year out, especially given the rate of technological change that we face now? I mean, you don't even know what's happening today. There's so many technological transformations just today, many of which have world-shaping consequences. God only knows where we're going to be by the time of the next presidential election. But... It certainly does seem to me the case that the Democrats are going to lose big in the fall. And so, you know, that's, that's what we'll focus on for the time being. So if you enjoyed this little short segment from the podcast that we did, here's another short segment to watch. Or if you want to see the entire podcast, 
Click over here. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.